All right, uh, Council of Jerusalem. So in the last chapter where, where we ended is uh, uh, basically the gospel is going out to the Gentiles. Paul's just finished his uh, first missionary journey with Barnabas. And, uh, and there has been Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. We have Peter preaching to Cornelius. Uh, we've got a whole church in Antioch. Uh, it would be in Syria today, Antioch, Syria, uh, that is made up of Jews and Gentiles, very cosmopolitan people from many different cultures and countries, and uh, probably a church that we would all feel very, uh, very comfortable being part of. Uh, but uh, back in Jerusalem, the church is still 100% Jewish uh, and uh, uh, they're beginning to uh, get wind of, uh, of these new churches that are being planted by Paul, which would be, uh, with, say, Asia Minor or present-day Turkey. Uh, and they're pretty excited about that. Uh, of course, there, there's the assumption, though, uh, by many of them, part of this, a large part of this church are made up of uh, a group of people, a sect of Judaism we're familiar with, called the Pharisees. Again, these are the conservative Bible guys uh, that are trying to hold on to the word of God and so forth. And they've come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And you can understand, again, some of their leaders were the key debaters and disputers with Jesus before his death and his resurrection. But uh, the idea now fits their theology, unlike other sects of Judaism that were liberal. Uh, they believe in resurrection. They believe uh, in miracles uh, and so forth. And they believe in the, uh, in the inerrancy and the entirety of God's word uh, of what they had in terms of the Tanakh or the, or the Jewish Bible. Uh, so the idea that Jesus the Messiah came and died and rose again, see this fits their theology. Many of them came to faith in Christ. Uh, some of them are now going to travel up to Antioch to this church uh, and they're going to begin to tell the Gentile believers there, that's awesome that you believe in our Messiah. Did we mention, though, by the way, you need, you need to be circumcised now? Uh, and there's probably some aspects of the law of Moses you're going to need to follow uh, as well, uh, which then Paul uh, and uh, Barnabas fall into sharp dispute. That means they have a big yelling match uh, over the whole thing. Uh, which will lead them all back to Jerusalem to try to uh, settle the matter once and for all. Uh, this is not just a turning point in the book of Acts. This is a turning point in church history. Uh, uh, this can go down uh, one of a couple of ways. Uh, they can either somehow miraculously uh, work this out and walk away uh, in unity. And of course, uh, they're going to do that. And we're going to see the principles that are, uh, by which they do it that are still uh, directly relevant and applicable to where we're at today. Uh, uh, or they could have split very easily. We could have had the Church of Jesus Christ of Judaism and the Church of Jesus Christ of the Hellenists or the Gentiles or uh, whatever uh, methobacterian name we want to place upon it. Uh, but instead, they were able to work out all of this. My uh, whole point is just to say that uh, uh, when we, we read Pharisee here, uh, Pharisee believer, it seems like a contradiction uh, in terms, and, uh, but it's not. Um, uh, it was natural for these guys to come to faith in Christ, uh, and, uh, and there's no evil intent here. They are just trying to hold to the Word of God. The Word of God said, men, are, you know, as you're a, a baby or as you convert to Judaism, you're supposed to be uh, circumcised. So they're, they're doing their best with the best they had in terms of understanding to hold to the Word of God. Of course, you've got Peter <clears throat> and you've got Paul that have both had divine revelation. Peter on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner and God speaking to them, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Don't make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And, and, and he, of course, goes on and preaches to the house of Cornelius. Paul gets uh, uh, knocked off his donkey uh, on the way to Damascus and, uh, uh, and uh, Jesus Christ speaks to him in a very supernatural way. Uh, Paul is converted there on the Damascus road, shows up in Damascus. Ananias shows up, prays for him. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. The blindness is removed from his eyes. He apparently is there for a period of time. And he says, I went to the desert of Arabia and just hung out with Jesus for an extended period of time. And so both these guys kind of understand the concept here. We're salvation by grace and by grace alone. And that's the major issue that's hanging in the balance. Would that be true or would that not be true? What would be the position of the church uh, moving forward? And, uh, and we could say uh, the church hasn't followed this uh, very well. There, there's lots of churches out there that teach we're saved by grace plus other stuff. Uh, and certainly uh, 
uh, you know, uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, some of the Orthodox churches uh, and so forth. Uh, certainly we could, we could give us examples of that. It's, uh, it's saved by grace, but grace is progressive. But somehow you earn it. And, and there's uh, other things attached to the gospel itself, which is unfortunate. Uh, but you, you've got Protestant churches that believe in baptismal regeneration. Uh, you're saved by grace, but you've got to be baptized to be really saved. And in those churches, then, they've got baptistries up front with the water in them all, all the time. So that if you come to faith in Christ, whether you raise your hand, you come forward, whatever it is, it's like uh, before you get out the door, they want a white robe on you and dunk you, man, because uh, uh, you're not really saved until you go down under that water and come back out. Baptismal regeneration. That's grace plus something else. So it's not that they, uh, we can be thankful for this chapter, the practical guidelines they give for unity, uh, but it's a constant uh, uh, reaffirming to our own thoughts that uh, yes, we're saved by grace and by, and by grace alone. And we shouldn't deviate uh, from that. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, not just this issue of uh, uh, who the Pharisees were as believers, uh, but the idea there's no New Testament. Now we mentioned last week, uh, this time period is right around 49 AD. And, uh, and Paul is going to come back from this council and he's gonna write a letter to the church in Galatia. Uh, and kind of inform them of some of these news uh, the, of this council and so forth. And so we can take Acts 15 and Galatia and put them together and helps us understand a little more of the picture of what's going on uh, and some of the things that were said during this meeting, which is uh, helpful uh, as well. But that's it. None of these things have been written yet. So the New Testament isn't there. The church is uh, very, uh, very lucid, uh, and this thing is all happening, and they're trying to figure it out. It's only 20 years since the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, and this becomes a critical juncture uh, within Christianity. And as I said, very relevant to where we are today uh, in terms of the practical aspects that uh, we'll see from, uh, from this text, because throughout church history, the church has not done a very good job of doing what the instructions are at the end of the chapter. Uh, we haven't very, done a very good job in terms of sticking to the gospel of being by, uh, by grace, salvation by grace and, and grace alone. So let's take a look at how this all comes about here as we're seeing the first five use, excuse me, first five verses uh, reveal the dispute over the salvation of Gentiles. Again, we're in Acts 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute among them, that means there was a bit of a shouting match that, that went on, uh, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others with them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the, the law of Moses. So here's the, the dispute. It's from uh, not all, but just particular teachers there uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. They're not denying that we're saved by grace. They're just denying that we're saved by grace uh, alone. And, and they want to add something to it. And, uh, and again, uh, it, it's helpful to, uh, to maybe use an illustration that, that I've used before in this regards. Uh, in their eyes, I mean, you grow up within Judaism. You grow up within the, within the traditions. You go up, grow up doing your best to keep the law. And then Jesus, the Messiah, comes. You receive Jesus. You receive the Holy Spirit. This is, this is, this is all you know. This is the, the framework of, uh, of religious life. Uh, and, then, and then something is happening here that is very strange. Again, the illustration, it's if you're standing in a, in a very long line on a very hot day. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and and uh, you're, you're an hour in the line and it's hardly moving and suddenly people are cutting into the line well up ahead of you. I hate that when that happens, but <laughs> I'm speaking from experience here. And guys are cutting in line way, way, way up there uh, and you're not too happy about it. Well, these, these Jewish guys have been waiting in line for 2,000 years. That's a long line. 
waiting for their Messiah to come. And, and he's finally come, and the line is moving. And all of a sudden, there's these Gentiles, and they're, they're just cutting, cutting in way, way up there. And they're not real thrilled about it. Uh, and they're not really sure what to do about it. Uh, that's really uh, the idea or the issue here. And again, uh, Peter or Paul or anybody else can't make reference to one of their epistles. Paul can't say, well, haven't you read the letter I sent to the Romans? Reads chapter 9, 10, 11. Uh, the only reference they can make are to the Old Testament uh, scriptures. Uh, Ken Hughes puts it this way. If Jesus was the Hebrew Messiah, anyone wanting his salvation would have to become a Hebrew first. How else could he know the full meaning and purpose of God? The Pharisee Christians banded together to make sure no one slipped by Mount Sinai on the way to Calvary. It's kind of like that line. Slip by Mount Sinai. I want to make sure you get the whole deal, the real deal. Uh, again, uh, it's an honest question. Uh, it's an honest dispute uh, to be having. Secondly, the dispute escalates, of course, when Paul and Barnabas debated with them. And, uh, and uh, uh, Paul's, you know, Paul is, <laughs> Paul is over this already. You know, uh, he is the Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, and yet he's been very humbled and come to faith in Christ. Uh, he basically has had... Uh, God speak to him over these issues of salvation, the nature of salvation, and so forth. He's been out preaching this gospel of grace and seeing men and women uh, and children come to faith in it. Uh, and so there is a, quote, sharp dispute that, that breaks out here. Uh, again, uh, some might say in this group of the Pharisees, unless you participate in our ceremonies and keep our rules, you cannot be saved. Wow, I'm glad nobody else has ever said that in the last 2,000 years. No, actually, there's... <laughs> That's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, unless you participate in our ceremonies and keep our rules, you cannot be saved. I, well, there weren't a lot of ceremonies in the church I grew up in, but there were a lot of rules. And if you couldn't keep them, you couldn't be saved. Therefore, I'm out of here because uh, uh, there, were, there were two types of people that could keep them. Uh, I mean, they, and, and if they could, uh, we would call them self-righteous today. Uh, of course, you want to frame those rules around things that you're pretty good at it already. And, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's still an issue uh, within Christianity today. So the dispute is over salvation. The essentials of salvation, it surrounds these Gentile converts. Secondly, the decision that changed the church, verse 6 to 21. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, that means a lot more shouting and yelling and screaming, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. It made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent uh, and listened to Barnabas and Saul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them people for his name. Uh, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruin and I will set it up so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even the Gentiles who call, are called by my name, says the Lord, who does uh, all these things, quoting Amos there, uh, known to God, verse 18, from eternity are his works. Ends the quote. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immor immorality, from things strangled and from blood. For Moses has, uh, has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Shabbat or every Sabbath. So a couple things about this meeting here. One, it's uh, reached... Uh, Decision is reached at a uh, public meeting, public meeting, but uh, certainly uh, of key leaders. Now, 
I mentioned Galatians. So if we put Galatians together with this, we find out there's actually four meetings. There's a public meeting uh, of Paul and his associates. Verse 4, they're welcome. They probably hear all about uh, their missionary trip and journeys and, uh, and so forth. Probably fascinated about the story of Sergius Paulus and got him becoming blind. Uh, or the Ilium, Iliumus, the uh, witch doctor guy, becoming blind so he could hear the gospel. And they get to hear all these stories. Paul being stoned outside uh, 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 Lystra, left for dead, and then God raises him back up and he goes. So they kind of go, probably go over all these things and welcome them back. Then there's a private meeting of key leadership based on Galatians 2.2. 2. Third, there's a second public meeting at which the Pharisees present their case based on uh, verse 5 and 6, and correlating that with Galatians 2, 3 to 5. And then finally, what most of this chapter is about, the public discourse or discussion uh, described from verse 6 on, in which four prominent or key leaders uh, give their opinions. Uh, and the first one uh, is Peter. Verse 7, Peter rose up and said to them, uh, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So making reference to uh, his preaching at the house of Cornelius. And this took a while. Peter wasn't on board with this idea of Gentiles getting saved uh, either initially. When, they're, you know, when we hear Jesus give the great commission, go in all the world and preach the gospel, we're thinking all the world, like everybody. But when they're hearing it, they're thinking, in all the world, wherever we can find Jewish people. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, they're just not there yet. yet. Uh, and, and there's no reason they should be, uh, uh, really. Uh, every time they hear about Gentiles coming into the kingdom, they're thinking in the millennial kingdom, later, not, not now. It's just, it isn't the way they, uh, they kind of uh, saw things. Uh, and so uh, remember, God uses, first, uh, first uh, short-term mission trip we see in the Bible, is he sends... Uh, 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 Peter and John he goes up to Samaria where Philip's leading a, a revival and um, he's, they're probably astonished the Samarit Samaritans of all people are receiving the gospel and being saved and, and we know that it had an impact on them because <clears throat> they went directly there but if you go back in one of our studies or just simply read the test, text on the way back they were preaching the gospel in all the villages and towns that they came through they didn't do it on the way up there they saw something that altered uh, their view of the gospel and who it was for, who could receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changed them. And then you've got Peter now willing, good kosher, kosher young man. He's willing to stay at Simon the Tanner's house, uh, which would make him unclean and so forth. So uh, Peter is definitely changing. And then you have the visions on the uh, rooftop. Peter's a little thick headed. He's your typical man. And so God has to repeat the thing three times to him uh, to convince him. And when these guys show up at the front door, go with them, and then he goes. And, of course, he's not even going to go in the front yard of Cornelius' house if God hasn't done all these things. And, uh, and then he goes in and preaches the gospel. And he gets called in on the carpet. You've got to go back to Jerusalem and explain what in the world he was doing in the house of a Gentile. And he's got to tell them, wow, man, they, God's spirit came down, and they all got saved. And I don't know what else to tell you. And uh, that's all there for us. So Paul, uh, Peter is reminding of these things. God chose me, and by my mouth, the Gentiles came to faith in Christ. If you want to have witness number one to convince somebody in the early church, Peter's not a bad guy to have on your side. Uh, a man of good standing among the apostles. Uh, a couple other things he says that's interesting. He says that in regard to that in verse 8, that remember God gave them the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them uh, the Holy Spirit. There's no distinction. There's no difference, uh, uh, Peter says here. Uh, prior to this point, uh, again, there's been a real distinction between Jew and Jew Gentile, but after the cross, uh, that distinction was gone. And of course, Paul's writing in much of, uh, much of the New Testament is trying to help everyone come on board with this, this very idea. Paul later would write... Uh, to the church in Ephesus, chapter 3, verse 4. He says, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. That, what was the mystery? They didn't understand in the past that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body 
and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Again, a mystery in the Bible is something that was not known, but is now known. It's, it's been revealed. We kind of think of mystery different. Mystery is like, who did it? Maybe we'll figure it out in the future. But when the Bible uses that word, uh, unfortunately, I guess there wasn't a better English word to come out of the Greek, and they almost kind of uh, say the Greek word uh, in, into uh, English, and it comes out mystery, but it's something that's been revealed. They didn't know in the past, ages past, that Jews and Gentiles uh, would uh, come to faith together in Jesus Christ, but it's been revealed now, Paul says, to the church there at Ephesus. In verse 10, Peter says, they're no longer under the law. Still trying to sort these things out uh, in terms of their tradition and life of faith. Uh, He says, "Uh, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, Gentiles, uh, which neither our nor our fathers were able to bear. Was what Peter's saying true? Yes, and everybody in the room knew it. Uh, they, they knew that none of them were able to really keep the law. They loved the word of God. Uh, they loved the traditions and so forth. The problem was it could never make men righteous. Uh, they could never fully keep it. Paul would say later he was given as a schoolmaster to drive us to Christ, to show us our need for a Messiah. How bad were they? Well, in 722, uh, the northern tribes, because they weren't so good at keeping the law, uh, were uh, were basically annihilated by the Assyrians and scattered to the wind. Uh, Many of the righteous Jews had already fled to the south before then. So in 586, though, not so good at keeping the law, 586, the Babylonians come in, uh, (coughs) ransack Jerusalem, and, uh, and burn it to the ground. Why? Not so good at keeping the law. When Peter says, we're not so good at keeping the law. You sure we want to put this on them? Everybody in the room is just going, yeah, 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 amen, I get that. You know, but they're not real thrilled with the idea, but everybody understands what he's saying here. So he gives them some facts and he gives them the deduction. Uh, The deduction is in verse 10. Now, therefore, based on what I said, why do you test God? You're testing God when you do these things. Four times Peter makes an us and a them kind of argument. States over and over, there's no distinction between us uh, any longer. Look at verse 11 again. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, this is interesting because he, he kind of flips. You would think he'd say, we're all saved by the grace of God, and so are they. But he does it the other way around. He says, they all are saved by the grace of God, and so are we. There's no distinction. He actually places them uh, ahead of those that he's speaking to. So not bad for witness number one. Witness number two and three, Paul and Silas. They're a pretty good lineup because Paul is Saul of Tarsus, the great rabbinical scholar, ahead of his peers, having studied the feet of Gamaliel. Everybody wants to hear he, what he has to say. These are Pharisees. He's a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And so they want to hear what Paul has to say. And then you've got Barnabas, who's got those Levi genes, right? I mean, he's, he's, he, he's Levitical. So these, these are two men in the early church that are, would, uh, the Pharisees would certainly uh, welcome uh, their, their comments and, uh, and their position and what they had to say. Now, Dr. Luke only gives us like one verse, verse 12. Uh, then all the multitude kept silent. Uh, listen to Barnabas and Saul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had performed through them among the Gentiles. Now, Luke has just given us a couple of chapters of the summary of what that was all about, all the miracles, all the things that took place uh, through their uh, first uh, journey there together. Uh, I, I'm sure that Paul went through many of those things that we've just been studying about uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but the bottom line his whole deal apparently is, uh, can be encapsulated by the idea, listen, I'm out there preaching the grace of God. People are saved by grace and grace alone. And in every instant, God did miraculous things among us, testifying that what I'm saying is true. I never preach. You're saved by grace, and now you've got to keep the law. You're saved by grace, but you also have to uh, be circumcised. You're saved by grace. I, I never preach that. I only preach the grace of God. And God supported what I was saying and what we were doing uh, by performing these miracles uh, over and over again. Again, Peter and Paul both had received uh, special visions. Uh, They understood that we're saved by grace alone. But they're trying to convince 
this uh, uh, a group of uh, a segment of the early church that very understandably believed they still needed to live somehow under the part of the old covenant, the covenant, of, but the new. Listen, there's whole churches that still do that. Is there, they, they, they're, they're not even sure what day to meet on. Uh, and uh, and they, 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 they choose certain dietary aspects of the Old Testament. Uh, very confused about this whole thing of Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm kind of going through this pretty, pretty slowly here, helping us to hopefully understand these arguments uh, that we don't fall into the same folly that uh, so many churches have over the years. Thirdly, uh, then James gets up. Peter said, this is how God has dealt with the Gentiles in the past. I preached to Cornelius. Peter, uh, Paul gets up and says, this is what he's doing right now among the Gentiles, and they're coming to faith in Christ. James gets up basically and says, and this is what God will be doing uh, in the future. Verse 13, and after they had become silent, uh, James answered, saying, now again, another perfect guy uh, to make his case. Now when James stands up, again, this is the half-brother of Jesus. It's not John uh, and James Zebedee. Uh, that James has already been martyred for his faith. Uh, this is the half-brother of Jesus who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after his death and his resurrection. And he apparently has become the leader uh, of the church in Jerusalem. Church history tells us that uh, he is known as James the Just. Uh, and that uh, Eusebius, uh, very early on in church history, writes this about him. He used to enter alone into the temple and be found kneeling and praying for the forgiveness of the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God, kneeling and asking forgiveness for the people. So from his excessive righteousness, he was called the just. James the just becomes the bishop, according to church history. And I think we see it in the text. The last guy to speak, James stands and says, now here's my judgment, boom. And he says, this is what we're going to do. Uh, this is where, how we're going to handle it. But again, when James stands up, all the Pharisees in the room are going, all right, here's our boy. You know, and now, and now he's going to set these guys straight. He's a guy of the law. Uh, he, he refers to the law 10 times uh, in his epistle, uh, the one bearing, bearing from his knee. Uh, and, uh, and so here he is, verse 14, he says, Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a, a people for his name. I, I, I don't know that uh, uh, as we read that earlier or as I just read it, uh, many of your ears perked up and thought, I can't believe he just said that. Did anyone have that reaction? See, I don't think we had that reaction. But all those people would have had that. Uh, people called for his name. Those are the Jewish people. That's a phrase that's used of the Jews over and over again, the people of his name. And James gets up and says, you know, the Gentiles, there are people called for his name. At that point, the Pharisees are going, this is not going well. I can just tell right off the bat. This is, this is I didn't see it going this way when James stood up. This is probably not, not a good thing here. But again, uh, they had the idea or the problem, uh, and a lot of Jewish people did, maybe still do, of reconciling these two ideas. They believe the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom. We believe he will as well. They believe that once he comes and establishes his kingdom, all people will come to know him and worship him, all the Gentiles. So do, do the Jewish people believe that Gentiles are going to get saved? Yes, during the millennial kingdom when the Messiah comes to rule and reign. We have a problem, though, because the nation rejected the Messiah. That kingdom has now been postponed or put on hold. Now salvation is going to individuals and not, and not a nation. And Jesus will come again to establish his kingdom. But now, before, before that, Gentiles are coming to know him and are being saved by the grace of God, just like the Jews. So they, they had, uh, they're having a hard time. They kind of had the concept, but they didn't have the chronology of it, uh, which, of course, was a problem during the earthly ministry of Jesus as well. And uh, lots, of, lots of things in the epistles trying to set this straight and explain it. Paul says it uh, very succinctly in Galatians 3.26 when he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you are Christ, 
in your Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when someone comes to faith in Christ, they don't stop being a man and they don't stop becoming a woman. They don't stop being Jewish. They don't stop being a Gentile. But uh, the church is made up of this group of Jews and Gentiles together. A mystery in the past now revealed in the New Testament. Therefore, therefore, I'm going to say something shocking. Therefore, <laughs> today, when you have what we would call messianic congregations, those are unbiblical. Those are, that's an unbiblical concept or idea. Why? Because we're supposed to be together. We're supposed to be together. Why do they do that? <laughs> because we haven't been too, too togetherness-like. <laughs> we, we've made it a little, a little difficult. And, and uh, they're trying evangelistically to reach their friends and their family members if they're Jewish. And so the best way they can do it is to present the gospel in the context of something that looks a lot like a synagogue. By the way, this looks a lot like a synagogue, except we don't make the men and women step separately. But uh, otherwise, this idea of gathering together and worshiping and having some, some talking head like me get up and explain the scripture, this is all based on the, on the synagogue. What we do, we call the church. But this was meant to all be together, uh, and it hasn't happened. Uh, the suggestions and the guidelines and the concessions the commandments that are given uh, at the end of this passage, we haven't done a very good job of following, and it's kind of separated things, and it's kind of a shame. I think that's why. If you go into a, a Messianic congregation, and I've had the, uh, the privilege to, uh, uh, to teach one in one on several occasions, uh, you'll, find, you'll find that <laughs> half the people there are not Jewish. They're Gentiles because they kind of like the whole deal. They like the Torah reading. They like the ceremony of it. They like the, the whole thing. Uh, it was actually all meant to be together, that we're one. There's no distinction anymore. That's what all these guys are giving uh, testimony to. Uh, and the, the church still struggles with the things that are given here uh, in Acts chapter 15, this idea of the mystery of the church. Paul makes this comment to, in Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, everybody else, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. It was always God's intent, always God's design. It wasn't an afterthought uh, in terms of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul goes out and preaches the gospel to Gentiles and they get saved. God wasn't in heaven going, oh my goodness, what do we do now? Oh man, no, actually that was his plan all along. Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations uh, of the world. We're all living testimony of that. That's why uh, maybe we don't sing it, but our kids over there in Sunday school occasionally sing Father Abraham. You know, uh, they, they love that song. I love to hear it uh, because we're all sons and daughter of Abraham because of his faith. As Paul says, his faith uh, in God was accredited to him as righteousness and we're saved by that, uh, that same faith. I think it's probably why there, there's such a, uh, you know, uh, an attraction uh, in the idea of, uh, uh, of being in Israel. Uh, even, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not. If you're Gentile, going there and going on a tour, there's just something special. Of course, it's where Jesus lived. It's where Jesus taught. It's where Jesus walked. Uh, but you can find yourself being very moved in very Jewish settings, like at the Western Wall. And it's, it's kind of hard to explain unless we really understand the, these scriptures. Uh, and we don't divorce ourselves away from uh, the Jewishness of Christianity uh, and our roots and where, and where they go to. Uh, and, of course, we certainly try uh, not, not to do that. And I realize I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit. Uh, but in the, the context of uh, what's being said here, uh, it's important to see. Now, James says something very interesting. I kind of mentioned he quotes Amos. Uh, verse 13, he starts his, After this, I will return. I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David. Tabernacle, tent, house. I'm going to rebuild his house, the house of David. I'll rebuild his kingdom. He's quoting Amos. And Amos is talking about the fact that the Messiah will come and the Messiah will establish his kingdom one day. We call it the millennial reign of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, Revelation 19, he returns with the church to establish his kingdom uh, here uh, on earth. We're all concerned about peace in the Middle East. We don't know how far ISIS is going to spread through Syria and Iraq. Uh, Jordan has fortified their borders. Israel has volunteered their military uh, 
uh, aid to, uh, to help them if they need defense of their borders. Uh, you've got 1,000 rockets uh, shot in the last 10 or 11 days from Hamas. You've got a few rockets being shot in the north from Hezbollah. A good portion of the population of Israel, as we speak, is sitting in a bomb shelter uh, waiting out this whole thing. Uh, there's 40,000 troops on the border uh, of Gaza and Gaza City. Uh, you've already got uh, special op guys that are on the ground trying to take out tunnels and so forth uh, because the, everybody there wants peace in the Middle East. It's going to come, but it will only come, Revelation 19. Jesus Christ returns to establish his kingdom. Uh, and we'll talk more about that on Wednesday night as we, as we get to Matthew 24. But uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, James is saying that by the fact that the gospel has gone to the Gentiles in no way nullifies the promises made to the Jewish people. That would be a big relief to them. You mean his kingdom is still coming? We didn't miss it somehow? No, his kingdom is coming. And he quotes, he quotes Amos. Hey, his house is going to be rebuilt. The kingdom of David is coming. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that the gospel has gone to Jews and Gentile in no way prevents that from happening. That's an issue within the church. We refer to them as a millennial. Millennial, the millennial reign of Christ. Ah, no. <laughs> no millennial reign of Christ. The Reformed churches, we say replacement theology. They say, they say, they would contradict James here. <laughs> they would say that uh, because of this thing called the church, Jews and Gentiles together, a mystery now revealed to us, all saved by grace the same. They would agree in these basic essentials of salvation. But because that is here now and has been established, God doesn't have to. He's relented. He won't. Ali, ali, oxen free. No promises to Israel. All the promises to Israel, all those good things, are now coming to the church. The problem with that is if God will not, does not keep his promises to the people of Israel, why would we think he'd keep his promises to us? That's why we constantly reaffirm he does keep his promises to all of his people. As Joshua said at the end of uh, his uh, warfare days and taking the land, uh, not one of God's good promises have fallen to the ground. Every one has been fulfilled. And that will always be true. And James reaffirms that very importantly here by quoting this passage uh, in Amos. Paul, of course, would write a lot about it in Romans 9, 10, and 11, but just a key verse in 11, 11, he says, I say then, have they, the Jewish people, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. <laughs> We're supposed to be provoking them to jealousy. <laughs> and uh, you know what? If, if we follow uh, what's in this letter that he sent up to the churches, uh, we might actually be able to do that. The decision was a compromise uh, that we see here. Uh, the decision was twofold. Uh, it was correct doctrinally. Jews and Gentiles are both sinners, both saved by grace and by grace alone. Uh, what James has to say, what they agreed to, what they wrote in the letter and sent out to the churches, never compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ. They never compromise uh, the word of God. But they made some concessions uh, as well. Two of them, two commands, two concessions. The commands, avoid idolatry and sexual immorality. Were those big issues? Those are major issues. And in, uh, in all of these cities, major cities that Paul's going to, there are temples. There are temple prostitutes. There are ceremonies that they go through. Uh, eventually, they're going to have to burn incense to Caesar if they, uh, you know, to prevent things being martyred from their faith. Idolatry was a big, uh, a big issue. Now, we could talk about it today. And, of course, anything that be comes between uh, us and God, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, has four wheels and is real shiny or it's, uh, it's a person, you know, become, it can become an idol in our life. Uh, and this is a command. We're to, you know, make sure we avoid uh, idolatry uh, of any kind. Important for them, very relevant for them. It remains for us today. Sexual immorality. Uh, listen, they had to be very explicit because the Roman culture is, well, it's a lot like our culture. In the Roman culture, sexual immorality was if a married man uh, had sexual relationship with another married woman. That was it. Anything else was fair game. Homosexuality, you know, you know, you just go right down the list. Within Roman culture, everything else was fair game. Uh, James knows this. They know it. 
You've got these, these men and women coming to faith in Christ right out of these very Greek uh, Roman cities, seeing this, seeing it practiced, knowing what the standard of the day was in terms of acceptance. It says you can't go with the culture. You've got to be counterculture. Any kind of sexual immorality is wrong. If we're going to be able to have some kind of unity here within the church, you boys up there in Antioch and gals are going to have to hold on to a couple of things. You're going to have to have those days of uh, idolatry behind you. It's not Jesus plus. It's not Jesus among other gods. It's him and it's him alone. You've got to be very clear on that. We're never going to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world if we don't get this thing straight. It's a problem. It's a problem today. A lot of people in the New Age movements, they're okay with Jesus as long as he's right there with all the other good prophets and, uh, and so forth. Uh, then you've got this idea of sexual immorality. We're at that point today. There are things today, sexually, that are completely accepted in our culture that uh, a generation ago we would have considered immoral. Hey, there's things that are acceptable today that 10 years ago <laughs> we would have considered uh, immoral. Chuck Colson once said that uh, 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 society's mores, their moral objectives, typically change generation by generation. But from the 60s on, they changed every 10 years, radically, 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 radically. And so James has to define, here's the issue with you guys. It needs to be defined once again for us as well. And then the concession. Those are two commands. The concessions uh, abstain from uh, eating, eating blood and meat from animals that have been strang strangled. Why the restriction? He tells us in verse 21. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues on every, every Shabbat or every Sabbath. What does that mean? It means there's a lot of Jewish people around. In pretty much every city you go to, there's going to be a synagogue. There's going to be Jewish people. So James is saying, can you help us here? We would really love to reach our, our family members and our friends that are Jewish with the gospel. And, and if you guys are out there and you're in, the, in that city, in Antioch, there was a temple at the Delphi. Part of the ceremony was to drink blood. Uh, if you don't think that's offensive to Jewish people, you don't understand much about the Old Testament. Saying, you guys can't be doing this stuff. Uh, you need to be careful even what kind of meat you're buying at the market, whether whose it's been sacrificed to. Uh, it's, it, it was a big deal. But do you understand the heart of what they're saying? Will you help us be able to reach our family members with the gospel? If we're going to say we're one and we're all the church and we're all part of the church of Jesus Christ and we're all saved by grace alone, uh, and, then, and then you Gentile guys are doing stuff that just totally offends the very people we're trying to reach, we've we got a problem here. We've got a problem. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't take much to make the application there, does it? You know, uh, a lot of what we... Do you, do you have family members you're trying to reach with the gospel? And you kind, you kind of wish, and maybe you even pray for, that God would bring into their life what I call credible Christians? Credible Christians. Not the, not the ones that say this and live this, and there's this thing called a credibility gap, but the ones that are actually credible, really living it out. You kind of appreciate that. When someone uh, uh, comes to your brother and he, it turns out he, they work together and this guy loves the Lord and is the real deal, and you're like, yes. You kind of wish there were more. That's what James is saying. Can you kind of help us out here? Uh, because we still got a lot of folks. We, you know, they're our family. We're trying to lead them to the Lord here. So can you not do a couple things? You know what their response was? No problem. Why did they say no problem? They were rejoicing. Well, because it meant they didn't have to be circumcised. There was that other part, see. A lot of the guys especially were going, hallelujah. You know, this, yeah, don't drink blood. I'm not into it anyway. Praise the Lord, you know. Order my steak, uh, you know, medium well with the Jewish person. I don't mind. I don't mind. I can, I can do this. Compared to the surgery deal, this is like no problem. We're going to find they were really rejoicing over this whole thing. The issue of blood, why was it a big deal? Not to belabor, just to make clear. Leviticus 17, the Bible is pretty clear in verse 10. And whatever a man of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore, 
I said to the children of Israel, no one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you uh, eat blood. Why? It's, it's a type. Uh, the animal would be sacrificed. The blood would be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. All pointing to God coming in human flesh one day and his blood being poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. This is kind of holy to us, you guys. So could we, could we not go there, not do that? And of course, it was rampant uh, in, the, in the pagan world. And boy, that's had a revival. You know that there are people doing ceremonies and they're, they're back to drinking blood. Uh, once, once again, meat strangled with, uh, you know, uh, you know, animals strangled. Why the blood's still in it? it hasn't been drained out. Uh, no, 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 not only is that uh, not kosher, but it's not healthy. You got a lot of hormones being released in that bloodstream, in that meat, when an animal is taken uh, in uh, in that way. Uh, and they say, can you do these two commands and can you make these two concessions for us? Uh, and this kind of ends it. Everybody hears what James had to say, and. Uh, and praise God, uh, the Pharisees are going, okay, okay, okay. We, we, we can live with that. And everybody else is going, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit confirming uh, this decision. Uh, again, for us, uh, the issues uh, might be different. You know, uh, we, we need to hold to the word of God and hold to the gospel, saved by grace alone. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are things that we can do uh, in a particular setting, in a particular culture, with uh, certain people, to not offend, to not offend the very people we're trying to reach with, uh, with the gospel. Does that, uh, does that make sense? I've, I've drawn up a list of 22 things. I posted it on the website. No, you know what? These are all things you need to pray about. Lord, show me. Uh, Lord, uh, are you open to let the Holy Spirit convict you? Lord, convict me. Show me. Because it may not even be what you wear. Where you go, it may be how you say the words that you say. Oh, man, Christians, they're so grumpy. You know, <laughs> you know I've met a couple, you know. So we, we, we don't want to act like we've been baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> we, you know, we, we're singing these songs, you know, we need, we need the love of God in us. And uh, I tell you, I, I don't know how Christians make it without fellowship because this is the only time we're, out, we're not outnumbered. <laughs> kind of nice to come in a room and be in the majority. How many of you are Christians? I think pretty much everybody here. Okay, I think I like this. I like this better than out there. Uh, I think I'm a little more freer to worship God and, uh, and receive what he has for me. Uh, we just, we need fellowship. We need the word. We need the love of God overflowing in our hearts if we're going to be able to live out uh, this letter. Well, let's look at it. They send it off with a delegation, uh, verse 22 to 35. Then it pleased the apostles and elders of the whole church to send chosen men from their company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who were of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Uh, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Uh, when they heard it, they rejoiced over its encouragement, especially the men. I just threw that in. Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So a delegation is chosen. Uh, verse 25 seemed good to us, uh, assembled in one accord, uh, and again, uh, the, this message uh, being confirned by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the de delegation carries the, the letter 
uh, and notice just a few things uh, uh, that it said. They make sure they disassociate themselves uh, with the people that came before. You know those guys that came up and caused trouble? Just to set this straight, we never sent those guys. Uh, we just want you to know that. Uh, and secondly, uh, they made it clear that uh, Judas uh, and Silas are men they had designated to come and deliver the letter. Uh, so you can hear from their words also, not just what is written. And then they say this very cool thing about uh, Barnabas and Paul. They call them beloved. And they say, you know what? These guys have risked their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I just think that might have helped Paul a little bit. Paul's kind of like the odd man out when it comes to the apostles. I mean, he kind of comes along later, the persecutor of the church. Uh, you know, was it, nobody wanted to talk to the guy initially. They were about ready to kill him in Jerusalem, so they had to get him out of town at one, uh, at one time. I think from, from the leaders of the church at that time, uh, if he, I'm sure he, he reads this thing, to know that they referred to him as uh, beloved and somebody that risked their life for the gospel. I think it had to mean a lot to, a lot to him. Uh, and then the delegation, uh, again, uh, they don't want to put a burden on them that neither them, uh, they, nor others could, uh, uh, could handle. And, uh, and again, making it very clear uh, these two distinctions, commandments, uh, and, uh, and things that they should stay away from. And then the delegation, uh, thirdly, is brought uh, to the churches, strengthen the church in unity. I uh, made it possible for them to present uh, a union, united witness uh, to unbelieving Jews uh, and a great, uh, great blessing. Uh, so uh, it has its impact. It does what it does. The church is able to go on, present a united uh, uh, message uh, to unbelievers out there that uh, this is a message for everyone, uh, for Jews and Gentiles. We can all come to faith in Christ, and it's by grace, his unmerited favor. We place our faith in Jesus Christ. We ask to be forgiven of our sins uh, because of his shed blood on the cross. Uh, we believe in his death and his resurrection, his ascension to heaven. He sits at the right hand of God. He is coming again to uh, establish his kingdom here on earth. And we will be with him for all eternity because of his grace and his grace alone. It's hard to fathom. I think it was hard for the apostle Paul to fathom. I think that he never got over the grace of God and neither should we. But that's our message. That's our message to a lost and dying world. But it kind of it kind of helps. <laughs> it kind of helps if we can close that credibility gap. It kind of helps if we can uh, do it uh, uh, unified and uh, and uh, and do it together. And if we can keep the you know first things first. Uh, just close with this illustration. Winston Churchill tells a story of uh, of, uh, of a family that was out for a, a picnic one afternoon uh, near a lake, uh, and their uh, young son. Uh, uh, falls into the lake and cannot swim, but neither can any of the adults. All very frantic, the kids bobbing uh, up and down. A passerby <coughs> hears the uh, uproar, runs over, uh, dives in some pretty chilly water, swim over, uh, grabs the kid, brings him out, and presents him to his mother. The mother at that point then says, where's Johnny's cap? You seem to have lost his cap. See, we don't want to be that woman. We don't want to be that woman. We want to say, he's saved, hallelujah, praise the Lord. He looks a little different than me, I'm okay with that. He's what you call blasted. You know what blasted is? Lots of tattoos. I'm okay with that. We just, we, we just can't really care about this stuff. It just does that's like saying, where's Johnny's cap? You know, it's just, it doesn't really matter in the final analysis. You know, we, we need to, you know, drop the peripherals and stay, uh, stay with the gospel. Does that make sense? And then we ourselves need to do the very best we can to close the, uh, that credibility gap. Will it be done with rules and regulations? No, it's a work of the Spirit of God. That's why I just say, uh, could we say to the Lord, you know, I'm really open to the conviction of your spirit, Lord. And if there's changes that need to be made in me, just show me. If you're not sure, read the Proverbs. Boy, they'll just beat you up every day. <laughs> and they'll, they'll direct us back Lord it just shows you how much I, I need the Lord and the grace of God uh, and the spirit of God to work in my lives and they still do that other people notice that and then, uh, and then somebody that's praying for somebody out there will be very thankful for you that you're in their family's life you're in their friend's life because we need all of us reaching others with the gospel of grace Amen the
every time United in one voice Holy 